I read your acknowledgments at the beginning of your book, which really kind of spoke to me about the amount of work that goes into putting together a research project like this. And I know you as like someone who's like, you're a church leader, you're a professor, you have a family, you have life going on in the background, and then you're taking on a really big initiative to produce this really important book. And I want to ask you about like that commitment and what it meant to you to have people like helping you along the way. Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. Um, often, uh, yeah, when you, when you list all those things out, it makes me kind of tired. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on. But academics often is kind of a lonely uh, task. When you think of you know somebody writing a book, maybe it's just you by yourself in a library or in your office writing and reading and researching and such. Um, but all the projects that I've worked on have emphasized to me that there are a lot of other folks that come alongside and help support uh, this particular project. I was in the situation where I uh, needed some time away from teaching so I could actually spend time writing the book, but I needed to find financial support to help me uh, take that time away from the classroom. My institution, Biola, gives a sabbatical once every seven years, but I was in between sabbaticals and I was actually needing some research leave before the sabbatical. and. Uh, my chair in, encouraged me to reach out to some friends. He he said something that convicted me. He said, do you believe in what you're writing? I said, yeah, I do. He said, do you think other people will believe in what you're writing? And I, I said, well, I hope. And uh, he said, well, don't you think it's worth inviting other people to invest in in what you're writing as well? And And that actually was incredibly convicting and encouraging. I reached out to folks and um, found that uh, a, a group of people close to me were more than happy to help support me so that I could uh, write this book. And that was very humbling, but it made me think uh, this this is how the kingdom works. We we do different tasks and we support each other in those tasks. And so I was very grateful that a handful of people were very, very generous. And, and, and I list them in the book. Yeah. Yeah, um, what's beautiful to see that and to see also like the church family come together to support you in this really important book. And I wanted to ask you about like what gave you the idea to focus in on the Catholic epistles? Yeah, these are, of course, seven letters at the end of the New Testament, James through Jude. And uh, sometimes they aren't uh, studied very often or they're maybe uh, passed over. Of course, in the church and in the academy, the Gospels and Paul's letters are are uh, front and center, and of course, uh, necessarily so. Uh, but my interest in the Catholic epistles came first through James, uh, the first of the Catholic epistles, or the first of the general letters. Uh, when I was doing mission work, this is almost 30 years ago, uh, doing mission work in Eastern Europe, I experienced, or I saw some folks in Eastern Europe who had uh, experienced lots of suffering and lots of trial and difficulty. Uh, we were in the former Soviet Union, and uh, communism had just kind of fallen, and we uh, saw lots of hardship. And it, and and all of that experience drew me to James when he talks about considering it pure joy when facing trials of various kinds, and how trial is actually God's way of producing in us enduring faith, a faith that is tried and tested so that we would be complete, mature, lacking in nothing. Now, that, that's a hard lesson to be confronted with, that God actually uses trials, uses these difficulties to shape us and to mold us and to grow us into maturity. But it was those experiences on the mission field that drew me to James. And then if you read First Peter, all, all kinds of concerns about suffering in the midst of non-believers, right? So First Peter is all about giving a witness to the world as they watch you, uh, but the witness often is in the midst of suffering, suffering well. So it was it, it was the content of James and of First Peter that initially drew me into these letters, and 
And since then, I've just been kind of fascinated uh, to continue learning from these particular letters uh, tucked in the back of the New Testament. So that's what got me into it at first. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because I think of James, I think of like a book filled with imperatives. Do this, do this. I don't I don't look at James as like a comforting book. I don't look at James as a comforting book for me. But it's interesting, it's interesting that you found it like a comfort, like you found it like a great resource. You're right. James is chuck full of instructions. And you're right. Uh, I think pound for pound in the New Testament, James has more imperatives than any other text. However, what's really comforting about James is his relentless, um, his relentless focus on wholeness. So at that very beginning when he says, you know, these uh, trials lead to an enduring faith so that you might be complete, mature, lacking in nothing. I think James is talking about wholeness there, being a whole person. And then in verses five through eight, he moves into don't be double-minded. That's like the person, like the waves of the sea, unstable. Double-mindedness is a deep fracture in our souls where we're not living the way we should. And James is calling us, yes, through these difficulties and through obedience and through some instruction to the life of wholeness. And yeah, Mike, that just really resonated with me and continues to resonate with me. Um, uh, it, it reminds me of Psalm 86, 11, where David says, unite my heart that I might fear your name. Um, I need God in the gospel to unite my heart so that I'm not divided, going in two different directions, vacillating between a loyalty to the world or a loyalty to God. And yeah, James is confrontational. Chapter four, verse four, he says, adulteresses, you can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God, right? So there's this real sharp call away from divided loyalties. But I find that comforting. I find that um, the offer in the gospel that God unites our hearts, heals us, and draws us to this path of wholeness. Um, that uh, It's not just comfort, but it, it feels like this is the right way to live. This is the way God has created us to live. And here James is yeah, challenging his readers. Um, but all along the way, he says things like uh, chapter 1, verse 21, uh, receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. That's that's not me saving myself. That's me receiving the work of God, uh, I think, in the gospel. Or chapter 1, verse 18, it's by God's will that he caused you to be born again uh, uh, by the word. It's uh, God is the one acting first in, uh, you know, in calling me to this new life. Of course, I must respond. Uh, but it's that idea of wholeness that really is encouraging, I think. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I, and I got to say, like, I really appreciate how thoughtful you are uh, when, like, going through these various books, like the book of James, in your commentary, as you are describing, like, different perspectives, like, you you do a really good job of, like, sharing, especially in some of the more complicated passages. And I think about, like, in James, um, the passage about faith without works is dead. And is this a contradiction with what Paul said? And I thought the way that you kind of shared that pers the different perspectives on it, um, I think you did a really, really good job of being fair to the different sides. Thanks for that. And I'm glad to hear that as a reader, that's how you perceive the presentation there. That was my goal. The, the academic or kind of character of the book, it's not completely academic. It kind of straddles academic and popular. But the academic part of the book, I wanted to make sure and present to the reader uh, kind of well-reasoned positions that they could go and investigate themselves and kind of learn. Because I think we can learn even from perspectives we disagree with. Um, and when we're in dialogue with perspectives we disagree with, it, it actually forces us to carefully consider the evidence that leads us in the direction that we go. or Help, help us carefully present uh, our perspective on things. So I always find that a beneficial exercise to to engage uh, thoughtfully 
and open with an open mind uh, with perspectives. Um, now, of course, there's a limit to that in terms of orthodoxy, but uh, yeah, I've, I, I'm glad that the, the book comes across like that because it is kind of a teaching tool trying to help people into considering perspectives. And I also like your approach too about how you, because um, a lot of times when I go through a commentary, it'll go through verse by verse. And I really like the fact that you kind of took sections to like talk about the thought, like what the thought was. And then you provide like an analysis of that. I really also appreciated the way that you organized, the way that you went through the commentary. Yeah, the book itself is a little bit of a hybrid between an introduction and a commentary. It's it's kind of straddling uh, those two genres, as it were. And I'm I'm hoping that it's helpful because sometimes a word for word, uh, line by line commentary is uh, it's much larger, uh, takes a lot more time to get through. And, and sometimes there's a particular detail in data in a really technical commentary like that, that, uh, you know, sometimes you're, you're uh, reading past. Uh, so, so this does two things. Each chapter introduces each one of these texts. Um, so it introduces James and then First Peter, Second Peter, 1, 2, 3, John and Jude. Gets you a little bit of background about who the author is, uh, what the date is. And then some of the structure and genre doesn't spend a lot of time there, though. It spends more time uh, f trying to trace the flow of thought. And, and you said it well there, Mike, that uh, I'm just trying to trace paragraph by paragraph the flow of thought of the whole letter. And really, I envision my book, I'm hoping that you have your Bible open and you're reading James. And then maybe you have this book open and you're just referring to my book every now and then, but really your eyes are on the text of scripture <laughs> and you're reading through James. And um, when, when maybe following the flow of thought gets a little difficult, you can just read a couple of paragraphs in this book and then move right back to the text uh, with a bit more insight so that um, I, I think of myself as a, a kind of a, a trail guide. Uh, I want you to see the beautiful uh, scenery. I'm just helping you stay on the path and appreciate how the path cuts its way through the through the scenery or something like that. Well, I, I think it's an excellent trail guide. Um, and the way I kind of approached it was I had my Bible open because you even said that, like in in what, I think one of your early chapters, like the importance of like really this is a companion to Scripture. Have your Bible open. And this is a companion. So the way that I was like reading your book with my Bible was I, I opened up the book of Jude because it was shorter <laughs> and I wanted to start there. Um, and then I looked at your your introduction about um, kind of the setting, the author. And, and I really also appreciated like you discussed even controversies over authorship. Like that was really helpful as well. And then you have a really nice um, breakdown of like how the book is structured. Um, so th like that right there was super helpful. Kind of like see like at a glance, oh, this is what is going to be discussed ahead of time. So then when you start to look at your Bible, you can kind of see that pattern. Yeah, the map. And then like all my questions that come up as I'm reading Jude or whatever book it is, I can then go look at what you were saying about it. And, and again, like going back to like the flow of thought. And I also really like how you connected these different Catholic epistles to each other. I thought that was really fascinating because like, a lot of the commentaries and Bible handbooks I have, like they'll exclusively study that particular book in its context, separate from everything else in our canon. You did something very unique that that was very interesting that you you connect them, which I've never seen it done before. Yeah, you're right. That is so. Um, uh, along with all of the features you've already mentioned, uh, there there are some of these. There are little text boxes. There are two types of text boxes in the book where uh, some of them are going deeper sections that, for example, in Jude, uh, ask the question, well, Jude uh, quotes First Enoch. That's a non-canonical text. What's, what's going on there? There's a little bit of a background or historical issue here to uh, investigate. Or Second Peter talk about authorship and um, what are some of the historical uh, arguments for and against Peter as author. And that's a little background window into an academic conversation. But the other kind of text boxes, and those uh, are what you're talking about in terms of linking the Catholic epistles, uh, 
if this, th this book has a subtle thesis, a subtle argument, and that subtle argument is that these seven New Testament letters are interconnected. Um, I, I have written an academic monograph. It's a different book. Um, and if, if you need help going to sleep, maybe you could read it uh, because it's much more academic. But it's making the argument that the early church uh, received these seven letters together and that we have all kinds of evidence, like manuscript evidence, that leads us to see that these seven letters were collected together in manuscripts and then circulated around in the early church and read together, similar to the four Gospels that were collected together, uh, actually put in a book of the four Gospels, and that book of the four Gospels circulated around in the early church. Same with Paul's letters. So in the academic guild, uh, it's a much more difficult argument, and a smaller group of us are working on this idea that the Catholic epistles also were a collection and should be read together. In, in this book, I'm trying to present to the church, uh, here is a way of seeing these seven letters, of course, as Christian scripture and as a part of the New Testament, but these seven letters have particular thematic connections uh, in two ways. You can see uh, key words and uh, repeated phrases that actually link those seven letters together, but then you can see themes that run all the way through. So, for example, one of the themes that come up in text boxes all the way through the main text, and then the last chapter outlines it a bit more, is the idea of love, love of neighbor, the, the love command from Leviticus. This is a command, this is a concern that shows up uh, throughout all seven of the Catholic epistles. And if you kind of, instead of reading down uh, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, if you read across, you can actually see where the love command connects uh, all the way through the seven letters. Uh, and I'm hoping this is a helpful way uh, that, that the church could engage these, these letters and then learn this uh, theology, learn these, uh, these key themes that they are uh, communicating. Like in your research, like did the early church, like were these like letters kind of like brought together and passed around together? Yeah. So the story of how the New Testament texts came together in the New Testament canon, it's a complicated historical story. I can, uh, I can give some general characteristics. The New Testament didn't form one book at a time, like. Matthew was included in the New Testament, and then, you know, James, and then Romans. That's not how the New Testament uh, grew or came to be. Instead, the New Testament came into being a chunk at a time. So some of our earliest evidence is for Paul's letters, a collection of Paul's letters that are circulating around and being read by churches churches even that Paul didn't write to. And Mike, some of our best information about the early collection of Paul's letters is 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about Paul's letters, uh, he says, that are hard to, you know, hard to understand. Um, and he mentions that these letters are like scripture. Uh, so we have very early indication that Paul's letters were circulating around together. Um, very, very soon after that, we've got evidence of the four Gospels circulating together uh, and being used authoritatively in the church uh, before there is a full New Testament. The story of the Catholic epistles is a little more complex. The reason is, is because whereas we have early church fathers talking about 1 Peter and 1 John and even Jude, we have to wait until origin, about 250, until someone definitively talks about James. And we have to wait about that long until someone definitively talks about Second Peter as well. So you see the problem there, Mike? With the Catholic epistles, we've got some of them uh, used and talked about early, and then a couple of them that there's silence. Now, silence doesn't mean 
that they were rejected. Silence doesn't mean that the text hadn't been written yet. It's just we don't have evidence. So for me to argue that the early church received the Catholic epistles as a collection and they circulated together, I have to make that argument uh, on into the third century, late third century. So 250 to 275. Uh, that is at, at latest, at latest, I think that's when the Catholic epistles are collected and, and circulating around uh, 300, 325. We've got some clear evidence that we basically have the whole New Testament at that time. How much earlier than how much earlier than 250 were the Catholic epistles being circulated and read around? That is a fantastically difficult historical uh, question to answer. Why? We, because we just don't have evidence. Uh, there's a lot of silence there. But Mike, it's my hunch that like the four Gospels, like Paul's letters, my hunch is, is that also the Catholic epistles were, were being used uh, at, a, at an early time as well. Though, again, historically, uh, that's, a, that's a harder assertion to prove. But what I think is important, uh, I sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. What I think is important about that is the hermeneutical issue, or in other words, the way we interpret our New Testament. A, a passion of mine is to reflect on not only the content of the New Testament, but the shape of the New Testament. And to follow that shape in how we read. So for example, uh, the four Gospels, notice that Luke is uh, collected with the four Gospels. Now, the early church had a, con a conviction that Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and Acts, but from a very early stage, Luke is circulating with the other Gospels instead of being connected to Acts. I think that might be an indication of how we should read Luke. We should read Luke alongside of the other Gospels. That's not to say we should never read Luke and Acts together, but I'm arguing that that's, a, that's an early indication of how the church was reading and understanding where Luke fit. A similar observation is instead of reading Johannine literature together, sometimes in a college class or a seminary class, you'd read the Gospel of John, the three letters of John and the book of Revelation all together because they're all written by the same historical author, John. Well, look at the early church. They are reading John along with the Gospels. Almost always, they're reading the letters of John in the Catholic epistles. And then, of course, Revelation is read as kind of the conclusion or the climax of the New Testament. So that's part of the insight I'm trying to. Uh, present to the church in this book, what, uh, what, what do we glean from the Catholic epistles when we read them as more of a coherent unit, when we're um, seeing common themes and common ideas that are held together, not in contradiction to Paul or the Gospels, but I like the illustration of a choir, right? All of uh, a choir, not everyone in the choir sings the same note, uh, but all those notes are sung in harmony. So I think the Catholic epistles have have their own notes that they're singing. Uh, and, and they're complementary to Paul, but they're different from Paul. And so that's part of my passion is to say, how, how can we rediscover the Catholic epistles' uh, song that they're singing, the notes that they are sounding in the choir of the New Testament, and the, the, the notes that they sound together? Uh, as a as a particular collection, so I hope that's clear. That's that's definitely a passion of mine, and what the book is is attempting to do. Yeah, what a beautiful way to describe these epistles as like part of a choir, and I love how you just described like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, like reading them as gospel accounts, and then looking at Pauline letters, like those are a certain set of letters that you read together, and then these Catholic epistles, like I've never thought about until reading your book about how these are all weaved together. And maybe that something I should probably do at some point would be to actually read them all um, in scripture together. I've never done that. I've always done them separately. Yeah. And um, so as a scholar and as a Christian, I feel 
pulled in two different directions in one sense because scholarship in the scholarly part of my brain has been taught to isolate each one of these New Testament texts from each other and study them on their own. And of course that's helpful because James has a unique voice, uh, Romans has a unique voice, uh, and, and I should study the context of that individual writing. But sometimes scholarship, especially secular scholarship, takes that so far that we have a fragmented New Testament then. We have a little Romans here and a little James here, and, and then huge contradiction between the two, and we talk about faith and works. Or we've got Johannine Gospel of Jesus and the Synoptics, and those almost start to tell different stories about Jesus. Now, I'm talking about extreme scholarship, sometimes secular scholarship in the New Testament. Um, but it's always been a Christian conviction that God's word is united because though these 66 books are authored by humans, they ultimately have God as their author. And therefore, they ultimately all have something to do with each other. They are unified. I don't want to paper over the differences, of course, but but this is, I, I, I think that the conviction that I'm expressing here is just a deep Christian conviction about what scripture is. It's, it's God's word. And though I can appreciate James's voice uh, over against Peter's voice, at the end of the day, uh, those texts are going to be in communication with each other. They're going to be connected to each other and they're going to be speaking a, a, a unified message. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that part of that is a, just a deep Christian conviction about what scripture is. Yeah. And I want to ask you about, as we're being like critical readers of the Bible, we're being serious students, we're, we're looking at different commentaries. Sometimes we'll come across comments um, in scholarship that maybe um, is difficult for us to understand how it weaves in with our Christian ideas. I'll give you an example, like, and you cover this in your book around authorship of of Jude, for example, or even James, where there's questions: Is this really the brother of Jesus? And and you and you do a really good job of kind of explaining different points of view on that. But when we come across like some of these difficulties, where it's like it's kind of jarring, like, wait a minute, I've always thought this is the brother of Jesus. And it seems like there's a lot of scholarship that says that, but there's also another group of scholars that say like, oh, it's probably not, probably written later. And we're trying to wrestle with our, in our minds. And sometimes we can doubt. And I just wonder like advice as, as a, as a Christian pastor, like how we kind of deal with those moments. Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. And I think sooner or later in our life of discipleship before Jesus, we're going to run into this kind of uh, issue when we're reading scripture and we are believing what God is saying to us and we're receiving scripture as our authority, uh, how do we encounter and deal with and work through difficult issues? I think the first thing I would say is just that God is not afraid of our questions and God is not afraid of critical scrutiny. Um, I, I, I love that about the Christian tradition. It has embraced academic engagement uh, from the beginning. Uh, in fact, I would argue a lot of uh, the current form of the academy has come from the, the, the kind of a Christian tradition uh, where we think that we can investigate the world because God really made the world and we can learn something about God if we investigate carefully all things around us. So what happens when we apply that to the Bible? I guess I would, I would encourage folks to not be afraid of engaging scholarship, not be afraid of engaging those hard questions. But at the same time, I think we always have to be alert to someone's worldview. Um, because uh, often you can pick up a commentary and you might hear someone say, well, all scholars think that, that G uh, all scholars think that Peter did not re write Second Peter. And uh, this is just a foregone conclusion. This is a scholarly consensus and uh, all the historical evidence points that way. Well, now hold on just a second. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes scholars can speak with way more confidence than they should speak. And I would want to say to a Christian, look, let's critically 
evaluate not only scripture, but let's also critically evaluate what scholars say. Uh, let's look at the evidence that they're presenting for this slam dunk evidence or slam dunk argument that uh, Peter did not write Second Peter. Um, and, and so sometimes you're going to run into evidence that is troubling or difficult. Wow, you know, First Peter and Second Peter, they don't look a lot alike when you start looking at the Greek and when you start looking at their style or their vocabulary. That there's a lot of differences. Can I think of some ways I might explain those differences? Yes. Uh, but then you come to, let me just put it on the table, the hardest difference between 1 Peter and 2 Peter is that 1 Peter uses the Old Testament as an authority. 1 Peter is quoting the Old Testament quite a bit. Scholarly assessment finds that 2 Peter only quotes the Old Testament once and then alludes to it only a few times. This discrepancy has led some to say, the same author, the same person cannot be behind both of these texts because, for one, the Old Testament is an authority and it's the grounds upon which he makes his argument. And in the other, the Old Testament doesn't seem to be the central authority. So how can the same person be the author of both of these texts? That seems to be a really uh, difficult question to work through. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on these uh, texts for another project. And the more I look at Second Peter, the more I am kind of doubting scholarship when they say Second Peter is not referring to the Old Testament. Um, I'm, I'm more and more skeptical of that scholarly claim because, okay, Second, Second Peter doesn't quote the Old Testament just like First Peter does, but Second Peter has all kinds of allusions to the Old Testament, um, is expecting a kind of framework of the Old Testament to be in the mind of the reader, is such that I, I'm not so sure it's such a hard question to work around to say, I, I think the author of Second Peter is actually relying on the Old Testament much more than scholarship um, usually usually uh, you know recognizes. And um, I don't know, maybe I could make a contribution here and say, hey, the, here's some evidence that Second Peter is actually using the Old Testament more than scholars say. So that takes a lot of work, though, Mike. And so how how much scholarly you know investigation does you know kind of the average christian someone who's trying to read and just understand the new testament how much do they need to do i guess i'm trying to say on one hand don't be afraid of asking these hard questions be skeptical of the skeptics <laughs> uh but also i just think there are really good resources and i hope and pray this is a resource to introduce to folks in the church here are some issues to think about. Uh, there are some historical issues that are uh, difficult that we need to work through, but here are some tools to work through them with, uh, all the while keeping you, you know, grounded in the text. Yeah, I guess I just want to land again on God is never afraid of our hard questions. And the text of Scripture has been open to critical evaluation for a very long time. Um, and there are no, there are, there are no arguments that just, uh, undermine the scriptures such that we should just pack up and, and go home. There are, there are difficulties to work through, but, uh, I, I think, I think we can pursue this like faith seeking understanding. I think Anselm, you know, his little phrase there is really helpful. I have faith. I trust. I trust this scripture. I trust that God is speaking through this word. But I'm going to seek understanding. I'm going to. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to analyze. And when I bump into a problem, my first response isn't, "Oh, the whole thing is wrong." Instead, my first response is going to be, "All right, Lord, I don't understand this. This is hard. I trust you. I'm listening. Um, I'm. I'm assuming there's a piece of information I don't have yet. So help me to keep working." That's that's my disposition as I work as a scholar. Um, my, my my first response is never to just question God's word. My first response is, okay, what do I not know? What what more do I need to do to kind of inform myself to learn about the debate? Uh, and then, are should I be skeptical of the skeptics in this point and evaluate their evidence? I hope I hope there's something helpful in those comments there for folks. Yeah, that is that is very helpful. 
Thank you so much for that. And and like I said, um, your book does a really good job of not being afraid to ask the questions. Like even when you present different positions from different scholarship, like I really appreciated that. Like you just kind of, you lay it out there for us to consider. So I thought that was really, really helpful. And I, and I love your comments too about, um, you know, going to God first and just praying for wisdom as we, we struggle with some of the, some of the issues, some of the discrepancies. Um, before we go, I wanted to ask about just you personally, as you like, you know, you've done so much research and scholarship into this area. And when you personally are like just reading the book of James for yourself devotionally, you have the ap- academic mind, you've done so much research. So when you look at James, you're looking at James entirely different from when I, when I opened up the book of James, right? So I'm kind of curious about like, uh, I guess your, your advice for kind of being a good student of the Bible from a, I guess, from a critical lens, but also from a devotional lens. Like I'm going to the to scripture to be taught by the Lord. And I want to hear God when I open up the book of Jude or the book of James. And I'm curious for you as you open up these books. And, and you're already saying something that's coming to my mind is that we come to scripture as disciples of Jesus. And we are reading these words on the page expecting to hear God speak to us through these very words. So, yes, I I would describe myself as a lifelong student of the Catholic Epistles. Uh, I don't think I could call myself ever an expert. I just think that's inappropriate when we're talking about Scripture. How can I ever become a master or an expert in in the things divine? I I should be mastered by them, not master them uh, in one sense. But, Mike, I think... I would say we're reading the same words. Yes, I've read these words and studied these words. But when I come back to James, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when facing trials of various kinds for the trying of your faith. Uh, You know, the trying of your faith works endurance. Uh, I'm, I'm needing to hear these words. Yes, I'm thinking of the Greek or the, you know, the historical background or perhaps the theological context. But at the end of the day, I have to slow down and say, Lord, you know, I have trials in my life and I fight against these trials. I'm fearful of these trials. I want them to be over. But you're telling me in your sovereignty, you're using these trials to to make in me what is pleasing in your sight, a, a faith that endures, a faith that bears up under pressure. God, give me grace. To not just know these words, but to see transformation in my life, to see uh, action that I might live, you know, these words. So, I, in fact, you know, I'm reading these texts every semester, I'm teaching them every semester, and I just feel like the text slaps me in the face. <laughs> You've read it so many times and you're still not doing it. You know, you, you know these things so well, but you're such a novice in living. In fact, brother, I I think of some dear friends in the congregation I worship in, uh, some older individuals who have lived long lives of faithfulness to Jesus. And I just think, okay, there's the expert. Go, go talk to, you know, names are coming to my mind, you know, go talk to her, go talk to him. They, they've lived the life of endurance. They've lived the life of faith and trial. They, they know something about James that I, I don't know. I don't know yet. I'm not trying to pit the mind against the heart. Please hear that. I just think both of those things go together. The head and the heart. God has made us mind and and heart, and we need to engage the text with both. Academic rigor, at the same time, open hearts to be transformed. We we, we need both of those things. Amen. And I think you've like definitely done this with this book, especially with your call to action to like have your Bible open like while you're reading this book, because actually it's meant, it's meant to guide your, your reading of scripture. So I think you've done that extremely well. Yeah. And one thing I might just add, sorry to cut you off. I, uh, as a practical, uh, kind of suggestion, um, I ask my students, uh, to sit down and read the book of James four times in one sitting. It's kind of like a blitz. That's probably one of the best disciplines. You're just absorbing the text. These are short enough texts that you can do that. You can kind of sit down, read through all of James four times, you know, in about 
three hours, four hours, depending on you know how quickly you're reading. But there's just something that happens when you do that. You're 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 filling yourself up uh, with the word. You're not memorizing the text per se, but you're just filling yourself up with it. And then and then when we talk about the text, I find students can kind of navigate. Oh, wait a second! I remember chapter four. He says this, and that connects to what we're talking about here in chapter one. That anybody can do that, and I think it's a good discipline to kind of immerse in, you know, in a particular book like that. I like your idea of read the whole Catholic epistles, read them all in uh, one setting. Now you need some more time for that, but uh, I think good things, <laughs> good things would happen if we did that too. So. Yeah. Sorry. I cut you off there. No, that, that's great. And actually that's really good advice for, especially taking on these, these smaller books to like, yeah, read it four times in a row, like really immerse yourself in that book. And then you can go to the commentaries, go to your book, pull up the Bible handbooks, and then it'll help to illuminate more of what you just read. Um, that's a great, that's really good advice. So yeah, thank you again, uh, Dr. Lockett, for, for being on the show, for writing this fantastic new book on the Catholic epistles, and just for sharing your insights to here today. Yeah, well, Mike, thank you. Privileged to be here and uh, so, so good to see you and chat with you today.